they're saying that Gen Z are lazy, you know, they're flippant, they don't want to turn up for work, they don't want to work in the office. As somebody who employs exclusively Gen Z women, it makes complete sense to me that they would possibly seem to a different generation lazier or less interested in work. First of all, would you be interested in work if no matter how hard you worked, you were never going to buy a house? I think their boundaries have set them up to be judged quite harshly by previous generations. They're there to do their job and they work very hard when they do their job. But yeah, they might want to leave at 5 p.m. and like, that's okay. What can brands be doing to communicate to the Gen Z audience? You need someone who understands it from like a cultural perspective. Yeah. And it's really hard to know what you're not doing right until you have somebody who knows the culture and you really can only know the culture if you spend all your time online and you know what to look for. I read recently on one of your LinkedIn posts that Gen Z simply doesn't buy into an aspirational influencer culture with the same excitement that millennials did. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for influencer marketing when it comes to businesses and brands? I think there's a lot of focus on like, oh, find a relatable influencer. Gen Z likes relatable content creators. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think a good way to go about that is to find creators that are really niche. What brands are doing it well in this space when talking to Gen Z? Oh my God. Oh, that's a hard question because I feel like we so often focus on like the brands that are not. Well, and why don't was... we start with the brands that are not? <laughs> okay, what I... brands are failing at talking <laughs> to Gen Z? I'll give two examples. Lauren, welcome to Top of Mind. I am very excited to have you here today on the podcast because I, as a business owner of a marketing agency, I get so many questions around Gen Z. There's a lot of conversation around Gen Z at the mm -hmm. moment, especially in the workplace. And as a Gen Z expert and internet culture expert, mm -hmm. I'm excited to chat to you. So thank you so much for joining me for the, for the next hour. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Look, I'm going to jump straight into it. And as I said before, you are a Gen Z expert. So mm -hmm. we're going to be deep diving <laughs> on that generation. Um, do you think that the internet is creating a generation that is addicted to screens? Okay, first of all, saying I'm a Gen Z expert is such a big call. So nobody it's come for me. Huge. <laughs> but I think that you live and breathe it. Like yes. you're speaking from your own experience. Mm -hmm. You run a podcast that breaks down internet culture and yeah. Gen Z. So it's like, own it, babe. Yes. Own no, it. I know. I'm trying to get more into that for <laughs> sure this year. But in terms of your question, absolutely, of course. I think. Are, we're all so addicted to screens. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily just like a youth problem. I think it's kind of like a gener uh, an entire world problem mm -hmm. right now. And that's only going to keep, I think, getting increasingly, I don't want to say worse is maybe not the right word, but that's going to keep uh, being perpetuated mm -hmm. as young people grow up with, you know, iPads mm -hmm. and screens, but you can't avoid it. And yeah. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that you know, you can avoid raising like iPad kids or you can avoid being addicted to your phone. Obviously there's things you can do to help mitigate that, but that's just the world that we live in. Like we're all addicted to our phones. So why is it, do you think that the younger generations are kind of, you know, it is a world, a world issue, mm -hmm. but why is it that younger generations are being kind of blamed for this screen addiction? I think it's kind of the same way that when you think about how we talk about different generations when they enter the workforce, mm. it reminds me of that. It's like older generations not fully understanding how a younger generation works because they were raised so differently. So mm. I would say it's the same thing with screens or phones, right? It's it's um, millennial parents getting blamed for raising iPad kids who are Gen Alpha, right? But it, and it, it makes sense. That's just the way of the world. But older generations might not understand that because they didn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. And our parents, as a millennial, like our my parents weren't raising me on a screen, mm -hmm. but obviously I was raised on TV. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. So every generation has their thing. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably a big part of it. It's just like the lack of understanding. Mm, absolutely. And I think before we get deeper into the Gen Z conversation, <laughs> I know we had this conversation before we started recording, but what defines the Gen Z? What dates are we looking at? 
So the oldest Gen Z now is around 26. Okay. And the youngest, I mean, the ages differ. It's I'm not as clear cut. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> right? We're yes. just outside of that. Yes. It's not as clear cut, I think, as like the millennial generation. The ages differ, but the youngest Gen Z is around 16. So they're actually getting older. Yep. They and are. it's a smaller generation than the millennial generation was. Okay, interesting. So touching on your point then around the workforce, mm -hmm. it's something that I hear a lot of. And mm -hmm. obviously as a business owner, um, I get in a lot of conversations with huge business owners mm -hmm. or, you know, leaders um, that are blaming Gen Z. They're, you know, they're saying that Gen Z are lazy, you know, they're flippant, they don't want to turn up for work, they mm -hmm. don't want to work in the office. Like, what kind of rhetoric are we hearing around Gen Z in the workforce? Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to, like I said before, how we talk about just all generations mm -hmm. in the workforce, there's so much of this like generational war that goes on. Mm -hmm. And it, like I said, it comes from a misunderstanding. And to me, like as somebody who employs exclusively Gen Z women, it makes complete sense to me that they would possibly seem to a different generation lazier or less interested in work first of all would you be interested in work if no matter how hard you worked you were never going to buy a house mm -hmm. you know like the, it, it the way that they are experiencing the world is so different than even millennials mm -hmm. did when we entered the workforce so I think that's one part of it and I'll kind of get into that a little bit more in a minute but um I think their boundaries mm -hmm. have set them up to be judged quite harshly by previous generations or older generations that don't quite understand those boundaries. Because even for millennials, when you think about how we were raised, like this is going to sound so dramatic, but like we were raised on hope. Like yeah. there was a lot of hope <laughs> and there was a lot of like, we were the girl boss generation, yeah. right? It was like, if you just, you know, hustle and have a side hustle mm. while you have your full-time job, you go to university, you can make it, you can be like Mark Zuckerberg. You can yeah. be, you know, we were the generation that like in, was so innovative. If you love this episode, help us to grow and reach more people by hitting the subscribe button and leaving a review. And Gen Z doesn't have a lot of that hope because they were raised in a completely different time. I feel like the hope kind of ended, again, this sounds dramatic, but like, you know, in the maybe mid 2000s. Mm. And that's when they started going to school and all of that. So I think when you look at how they approach the workforce, it's very different. They're there to do their job and they work very hard mm. when they do their job. I'm sure you know that as someone who also employs Gen Z. Like yeah. I hate that rhetoric about them. Like yeah. my Gen Z staff are so amazing. Mm. They're such hard workers, but yeah, they might want to leave at 5 PM and like, that's okay. Mm. You know, I think that's it just a different way that they approach work. Um, and we saw this with millennials, right? Like mm -hmm. there was a million think pieces online when we entered the workforce and how we were entitled and all we wanted to do was like buy coffee and avocado toast. <laughs> and it's just previous generations not understanding the newer generations coming in. I don't think it necessarily has anything to do specifically with Gen Z. I think it's just how it's always going to be. I agree. And I think also, as you said, when it comes to kind of generational um, or generations entering the workforce, you know, we look at Gen Z or I look at Gen Z now and I go, cool, you've been raised in a um, world that, you know, is so deep in instant gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, you can order a parcel on the Iconic and it's at your house in three hours. Mm -hmm. You can order on Amazon and it appears in an hour. Like there's so many things that that they're raised in and environments they're raised in mm -hmm. that that that's not their fault, but that's yeah. the generation that they've kind of grown up in. Mm -hmm. Same as our parents, you mm -hmm. know, growing up in a generation where mental health wasn't a conversation mm -hmm. that they were having. I think that, you know, changing the way in which we employ or we manage team members mm -hmm. based on the generation that they've been raised in needs to be a bigger conversation. It's something that I talk about with my team a lot around, you know, the Gen Z team go, you know, every six months they want a pay review. Mm -hmm. Am I going to give them the same pay review that they would get in two years' time? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But can I make it more attainable for them to get an increase or see an increase or a reward for their work mm -hmm. quicker mm -hmm. than they would 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that employers need to consider when they're employing different generations in the workforce. Is there anything that you've noticed as a business owner mm -hmm. but also as somebody that employs Gen Z mm -hmm. in terms of the way in which employers have a responsibility to change the way in which they're managing Gen Z? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of ignorant to presume or expect any generation to come in or just anyone to come in and for them to completely bend to 
how other generations did it, especially the digital generations. I think that's why millennials got so much flack when we entered the workforce. We were the first generation to grow up very much online. And now Gen Z is the first generation to grow up with social media. Mm -hmm. Like millennials, like I didn't get Instagram until I was like, I don't know, maybe 21. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it was definitely not part of my teenage experience. Mm -hmm. But for Gen Z, they're getting Instagram and TikTok and all of that at like age nine, you know? So it's just completely changed how they function, but also how they would produce work. And so I think we need to, as bosses, accept that and work with them Mm -hmm. on that. And if you think about the state of, I don't know, corporate culture, like the, the workforce now anyways, now you can't really expect to be in a job longer than two or three years at the end of the day, unless you are working for like a small company, you know, there are mass layoffs everywhere. The way that COVID changed the workforce, it's just a completely different experience Mm -hmm. for younger generations, not just Gen Z, even millennials and Gen Alpha that will be coming up. So I think the rate of change is so quick now Mm. and it can be hard to keep up, but that's as employers, like that's our responsibility is to stay in touch with the younger generations that we're going to be employing. Otherwise go employ a boomer. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think also to that is like, they're not going anywhere. Totally. So it's like the more you put your head in the sand around the fact that you can apply this kind of wand Mm -hmm. to the same generations in terms of how you manage them, how, Mm -hmm. you know, you employ them, et cetera, Mm -hmm. they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if anything, you're then just going to have to learn to adapt how to, you know, hire and employ Gen Alpha. Totally. Because they're not going anywhere either and Mm -hmm. they're going to be part of the workforce for the next 40 to 50 years anyway. Yeah. Um, I think it's so, so true. I think... So then with that in mind, obviously as a, you know, leader or a boss, there's there's one way of looking at, at Gen Z. From a brand point of view, what is something that brands need to be conscious of when they're communicating with the Gen mm. Z community? I would say just don't try so hard. And I know that's <laughs> kind of a weird thing to say, but I'm going to think, okay, so – if you consider what just happened with Bumble this week, right, with their messaging. So those billboards had a lot of issues to begin with in this rebrand, but I would argue that this rebrand appeared to be targeted at Gen Z. I know that that might not be a totally true statement. They have not confirmed that, like who they were necessarily targeting. But if you think about who would have, what generation would have, you know, the biggest cohort of single women, it would be Gen Z who are looking to date. Um, And I think a lot of the rebrand that was teased prior to the billboards coming out was very online. Like the imagery that they were using on their Instagram when they wiped it all clean, that's a very like modern nude marketing tactic to wipe everything clean and have like a new era, right? And then if you think about all the, it was like the fainting Victorian women who were like, I'm so exhausted. That's such like a TikTok meme. So Mm -hmm. I would argue because of all these reasons, they were targeting Gen Z. I think what went wrong here is that with the messaging, they tried too hard. I mean, a lot of things went wrong, (laughs) but I think one of the things that went wrong is- Separate (laughs) podcast. Yes, yes. They tried too hard to be like Gen Z's friend. Like they tried too hard to lean into Gen Z's like savage humor Mm. with the ad copy that they specifically chose. And that doesn't work on younger generations in the way that it worked with millennials. Mm. Like if you think about Instagram and brands that grew on Instagram in the 2010s, their whole thing was that they had like personalities Mm. and they spoke to us like friends. But we were used to that because we grew up on magazine culture Mm. where when you're consuming a magazine as a preteen, as a teen, you're reading it as if it's like a big sister giving you advice. Mm. And so millennials and previous generations, like we were down to be told like what was trendy, who we were, what we should be buying. But growing up on social media it's so different like they have the ability to kids kids nowadays oh my god I literally (laughs) sound 100 years old but anyone that grew up with social media from like you know preteens now um they have the ability to carve out their identities through choosing who they follow what they watch all of that stuff whereas previous generations we were told that right so it's just a completely different experience Mm. for them they don't want to be having a, fr- uh, they don't want a brand to feel like a friend. They don't mm-hmm. want a brand to talk to them like a friend. They want a brand to address their issues. They want a brand to make them feel supported and heard mm-hmm. as opposed to being like, hey, bestie, mm-hmm. why don't you try our product? Like that doesn't work on them. It's not what they're interested in. So um, I kind of forget your whole question. 
<laughs> no, I think we were talking about what brands, what brands what they can should do. be okay, doing yes. <laughs> from a Gen Z point of view. But before we kind of go into the, the, the kind of actionable things, for anyone that's not familiar with what happened mm. with Bumble this week, and obviously at the time of recording, this podcast will come out a little bit later. Yeah. What did Bumble do? So they did a rebrand. Uh, I think it was a few different steps. The first is that they teased a rebrand and people thought that the app or the product itself was going to change a lot. And it didn't. They just released a few features. And one of the features was that men can now message women first. And that kind of goes against the whole like ethos of the brand, right? Mm. So that was kind of the first thing where people were like, mm, okay. And then they released these billboards that went up over the weekend in LA. I think it's just exclusive to LA. Mm. Um, and they've since been taken down. But they said... <laughs> There was a few different messages, but one of the messages was, um, thou shall not give up dating to become a nun. And one of them said uh, something about, oh, you know damn well that celibacy is not the answer. And that that's addressing young mm -hmm. women and their choice to stop dating and their choice to stop having sex because of how... I mean, uh, so many reasons, mm. but largely because women are saying like, it's not worth it for us. And mm. like men are trash basically. <laughs> so instead of, you know, targeting their billboards towards, or they're advertising their rebrand towards fixing that problem and supporting women and trying to figure out kind of like what's going wrong here mm. with whether it's their product or it's just like men's culture in general right now, um, they almost... I don't want to say victim blamed because that's kind of extreme, but they placed the onus on the women. Well, they gave the power back to the men. Yeah, totally. Right? And I think that's the biggest problem that we're seeing in society at the moment is that a la large part of the decision-making cohort mm -hmm. is males. Yeah, for and, sure. And, you know, we don't have women in those decision-making positions um, to be able to inform the majority of decision-makers. Mm -hmm. um, so as a brand, that's obviously Bumble probably what not to do. Don't try yes. too hard. Yes. But... I what can brands be doing to communicate to the Gen Z audience? I think you need to be, I don't know, maybe this is reductive, but I think you just need to be <laughs> chronically online. Like, I think you need to have someone on your team. Yeah. If you actually are trying to target Gen Z or Gen Alpha, you need to have someone on your team who, you know, not, doesn't just like understand social media. I think that's kind of a, that's more of like a marketing role. Like a social media manager mm -hmm. is very like, in the weeds of the analytics and the strategy. Mm. You need someone who understands it from like a cultural perspective. Yeah. And it's really hard to know what you're not doing right mm. until you have somebody who knows the culture. And yeah. you really can only know the culture if you spend all your time online and you know what to look for. Mm. So that is kind of the difficult part of it. We do a lot of Gen Z uh, consulting for different brands through our media company. And that's always the biggest advice is either you need to get a consultant who, if, if you're very serious about this, um, you need to get a consultant who understands the space or you need to hire someone as almost like a culture, like a full time, like TikTok cultural consultant. Mm. I'm sure there's an actual appropriate like marketing term for that, but I don't know it. No, I like it. Um, I like it. <laughs> but part of that is how do you hire for that role if you don't know what you're looking for? Totally. So I think that's probably my biggest piece of advice is being you need someone who's like in the weeds and understands because I mean, harking back to the Bumble example, one of the reasons why I think that didn't go well. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, it sounds like they had no women in the room or maybe mm. they didn't do pre-testing on their advertising. I just agree with that. I mean, I would say that Bumble probably has women in all levels mm. of their company. I'm sure they did some type of pre-test. Like they're a huge corporation. Mm. I'm sure that they did all the steps properly. This was a really big rebrand and a big project for them. Mm. Um, what I would say was possibly missing was Gen Z women in the room because what I saw that really went wrong here in terms of when I'm looking at it from a Gen Z lens, mm -hmm. like a youth lens, is that the reason why young women have stopped dating l largely is they're setting this boundary, as we said, Gen Z, they're like a generation of boundaries. They mm -hmm. love that. And that's part of their power. And that's so admirable. Mm -hmm. Like I see millennial or millennial women and men all the time saying, I wish that I had like the balls that Gen Z has 100%. to be like, I'm leaving at five yeah. or like, I'm not doing that extra project, yeah. you know, because at the end of the day, like that is what's going to give you that like work-life balance mm -hmm. and all of that. So anyways, my point is they put up these boundaries and obviously these advertise, these billboards kind of in a way like mocked those mm -hmm. boundaries. 
But I think a big reason why Gen Z women are putting these boundaries up when it comes to dating is because if you think about how TikTok and Twitter and all these social media platforms, how they have really exposed men and women Mm. to these really dangerous, harmful pipelines Mm. that previously, if like anti-woman pipelines, incel pipelines, if you think about Andrew Tate, he was so popular a few years ago, right? That's just one example. And everybody heard about him. That those were kinds of like pipelines or corners of the internet types of content that if you wanted to engage in that previously, you had to like actively seek that out, right? Mm-hmm. You had to go on like 4chan or all these different forums and find these corners of the internet. Now they just get presented to you on your for you page or on your Twitter feed or whatever. And that can so easily open up a pipeline for somebody, right? So I think part of it is understanding how the internet functions and that internet culture is just culture now and Mm -hmm. what is happening on the for you page of tiktok and all these young men being exposed to this stuff they're so much more empowered to be Mm anti-woman openly i'm not saying that young men are more misogynistic than previous generations i would say that's definitely not true but i think that a lot of in a lot of ways young men now are much more empowered to be openly misogynistic and anti-woman and follow these influencers publicly mm-hmm. in a way that previously that was kind of you know just for like the bro chat yeah. <laughs> or whatever totally, right totally the private group chats totally um and then women like if you think about it from our perspective too like i've been served that type of content before of course that's just how algorithms work and so Now, women are seeing all of these young men that are in their age group who are being openly misogynistic and anti-woman, even if that is how men always functioned. Mm. We didn't necessarily see that. So now we're so much more aware and we're being presented with that content, too. So I think it's it's much more of like an awareness going on. It's like a deeper understanding of how hateful men can be and dangerous men can Mm. be towards women. And that to me was one of the biggest missteps that was made in this campaign Mm. was the lack of understanding of why this generation would stop dating. And there's a million other reasons why they would stop dating and become celibate or choose celibacy for now. But with that one example there, it's just a different, it's just a completely different cultural landscape than when millennials were dating. Like I said, I got Instagram and like when I was like 20 or something, you know, it's just, it's so different. There was no, we were not exposed to this type of content. And so I think previous generations of women were maybe, I don't want to say naive because that's definitely not the right word, but we were just not exposed to it. We didn't know. Yeah. And it also wasn't being talked about. Yeah. I think there wasn't those channels to talk about it. Right. And I think that, you know, as you said, on both sides of the coin, Mm -hmm. there is, um, you know, this abundance of information out there that allows people that do have that particular stance Mm -hmm. to be celebrated to talk about it. Or, you know, in Andrew Tate's case, like he was celebrated because it became clickable. It became something that people wanted Mm -hmm. to watch or wanted to engage with because it was an opinion that wasn't currently kind of out there on mass market. So with that in mind then, how important is it for brands to understand internet culture before they do a campaign or before they launch a product or a service? I mean, it's it's literally everything. Mm. It's I feel like it's so important. If that's who you're targeting, if you're yeah. targeting younger people. But like I said, internet culture just is culture now. You have to understand how this will play out online because it's uh, the reaction to something in real life is very different than how it could be perceived online or how it could blow up online. Mm. So you have to really understand, I guess, the temperature. And like, if you're trying to do like rage bait marketing, then Mm -hmm. that's fine, of course. But I think understanding how algorithms function, how group mentality functions Mm -hmm. online, how something snowballs like this, so important. Speaking of snowballing then, baby reindeer. Oh my God. (laughs) Let's go there for a minute. Yeah. Because I feel like It was something that everyone was talking about from a Netflix point of view. Mm -hmm. And then the moment she did that Piers Morgan interview, Mm -hmm. it has become a TikTok sound everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like literally every second TikTok I see is a sound from the interview. Yeah. Like how could something like that have been avoided if it was a brand or like what, like what is that teaching us? I think with baby reindeer, it's, There's like two things happening. The first is obviously there's a lot of discussion about if it was an ethical Mm. uh, piece of media to create when Mm. 
it was very obvious that Martha, the like the real life Martha, Martha wasn't hidden very well. Mm-hmm. You know, her identity wasn't hidden or as hidden as Richard Gadd said it was. So I think there's like questions about the ethics of what he did and Netflix platforming that. Mm-hmm. I actually don't know if Netflix will do anything like that again. You mm-hmm. know, I think I'm actually quite surprised that they didn't make him change more details about her. Yeah. She was so easy to find. Like she really was. So I think there's that conversation which makes it really buzzy and then there's the other side of it which is people saying like he doesn't really owe her anything like he's allowed to tell his story and then of course now with her interview with Mm. Pierce Morgan then there's that side of it too it's like well she's allowed to tell her story then so I think it blew up in this way because it's a true story and because it was easy to find her and then with that kind of being said when it comes to kind of echo chambers in Mm. terms of Um, kind of polarising public opinion, you Mm. know, as you said, especially when it comes to Baby Randy. I know even Mm -hmm. just the conversation that I've had in the last week, Mm -hmm. there's so many sides to the story. There's his side, Mm -hmm. there's her side. Then there's the side that Netflix says that it is based on a true story. She's Mm -hmm. saying it's not true. Yeah. Then there's also people that say that she's mentally unwell yeah and therefore should not have been put in a position where she was put on TV without media training or without a PR team or anything like that. So, the internet, you know, it, it's known for creating these echo chambers of, you know, if you want a certain piece of content or you want to sit within a certain group of people that have a particular opinion, there are these echo chambers that exist on the internet that allow that opinion to be kind of backed or confirmed. Mm-hmm. How does, you know, how do we navigate echo chambers and like the right to the free speech and mm-hmm. things like that when it comes to kind of a conversation like Baby Reindeer? Mm. I think when it comes to, I guess, are you asking about like cancel culture in general or just kind of like how conversations become so siloed? Yeah, I think it's how, how as you said, there's deep pockets of the internet yeah. that don't allow kind of, you know, I, I've seen it like a couple of my TikToks recently, for example, have gone wild. Mm. And it's, it's crazy to me that there's some of them that just go wild for absolutely no reason other than the fact that I've got an opinion on something yeah, yeah. or I present something that everybody was thinking but nobody said out loud. And there are certain people when they see certain comments that snowball on that because they're like, well, someone else thinks like mm-hmm. that, so I have the right to think like that as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think that, you know, the internet is great at presenting both sides of mm-hmm. an argument, mm-hmm. but far too often people end up in corners of the internet yeah. that don't have both sides presented. Yeah. So it's like from an internet point of view, how do we ensure that, you know, people have the right to those mm. elements of free speech and their opinion and things like that mm. that doesn't become dangerous where they only have kind of yes men or an yeah. echo chamber of people that support what, you know, they're saying. Yeah, I think it really comes down to media literacy, which is unfortunately a massive problem we lack it like across the board around the world every generation and I truly believe that's because previously like prior to social media not even just prior to the internet prior to social media which was what only maybe 15 Mm. years ago if you were consuming an opinion or you were consuming information or news in the media whether it was online from an article in the newspaper a magazine whatever that was factual information that was being delivered to you by a journalist. Mm. Of course, every media publisher has some type of lean, right? It might be left or right or whatever. They might have some type of like agenda, but at the end of the day, the information that you were getting for the most part was vetted. It had primary sources. It was, you know, fact-checked by a team and social media has made it so that now anybody with a Twitter account can write something and claim it's fact and buy a blue check. And that's incredibly confusing for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, older generations, younger generations who never experienced where everything was factual, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think when you think about how quickly all of this has changed, how social media has Mm -hmm. expedited uh like the concept or sorry, has, uh, yeah, expedited, I suppose, a lack of media literacy Mm -hmm. and has really muddied the water Mm -hmm. when it comes to like the concept of an expert. It makes total sense that we are looking at everything we're consuming online 
and it's incredibly confusing. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what the right answer is. Yeah. And people don't, you know, now we don't understand how to properly vet that because before yeah. it was like, well, if you're reading an article, who is the publisher? Who's the journalist? Mm -hmm. What are the primary sources? What experts did they quote? That you could learn in school. Mm. Now it's like we need to have other courses on how to properly vet information that we're getting on TikTok yeah. or Twitter or whatever. So I think so much of the problems online when it comes to echo chambers, misinformation, disinformation, it comes from a lack of media literacy. And that's a massive problem that social media, it's almost exclusively, in my opinion, social media's fault. <laughs> totally. And I think, so, okay, if you were given like this genie in a bottle, mm -hmm. right? And you had three wishes mm -hmm. or three things that you were like, hey, this is this is how we're going to combat misinformation. Yeah. This is how we're going to change it. What would you do? I would say we absolutely need to get some type of course in schools, like from literally grade school, every single year you need to be learning media literacy in not just a digital age, like a social media age. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be changing with the... Pay, like the pace that things are going at mm -hmm. with like TikTok, for example, TikTok wasn't even a thing like four years ago, yeah. you know, that has blown things up. So I think that would be a big one is like educating children on this and educating parents. Mm -hmm. That's a big one too, because how can parents even understand, you know, for bringing back the Andrew Tate thing, that was a huge conversation is parents were like, well, we don't even know who this man is. Like we had no idea that our young boys were following this man and we had no idea mm -hmm. where they were finding him, what he was saying. Uh, so I think understanding kind of, or I guess education, educating mm -hmm. parents, children, everyone on media literacy. And that's not just, you know, is this video that you're watching made with AI? Obviously that's important. You know, you mm. should be able to learn how to identify if something's real or not, yeah. but it's more so is the information that you're being presented from a credible source? Mm. You know, what is their motivation behind presenting mm. this information to you? And how can we ensure that what you are then regurgitating mm -hmm. whether it's to your friends or online or whatever is like factual information yeah I think I mean just thinking about it now I think you know even our generation like we're millennials mm -hmm. and our generations before us so like the boomer generations mm -hmm. and things like that we're kind of taught to interrogate information right mm -hmm. we're kind of taught to be like is this real? Mm -hmm. Where has it come from? Because we have been raised in that kind of environment where you're, you know, taught to fact check things mm -hmm. at school or university or whatever. But I feel like that's kind of fading as kind of generations come through of, you know, I say this all the time is that you only have to know 1% more than the person that you're talking to totally to be considered an expert. And that's terrifying. <laughs> Especially when it comes to the world of like investment, financial advice, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that or anything that's, you know, potentially harmful, it, it's terrifying. So, I mean, you mentioned it before around cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Is it a thing? Mm -hmm. Like do people stay cancelled forever? No, 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 no. <laughs> Can we think of any example of someone who's been cancelled forever? Even a Harvey Weinstein is getting a comeback right yeah, now. Yeah, that's... Absolutely not. Cancel culture is not forever. I think... I think cancel culture, the conversation is usually very black and white, and I don't see it that way at all. Mm -hmm. I don't see cancel culture as a net positive or a net negative. Mm -hmm. I know it gets a lot of bad rap, and of course, influencers hate cancel culture and all of that. My stance on cancel culture is, A, if you are more concerned or if your biggest concern is about getting canceled, then mm -hmm. that's a place of privilege. Yeah. And B, the... I guess context of how cancel culture really blew up is super important and often missed mm. in this. If you think about cancel culture and when it was kind of at its peak, and I would actually say it's kind of dissipating a little bit, okay. like it's calming down a little bit now, but it, when it was really at its peak, that was like 2020, you know, mm. it was COVID. We were in lockdowns. We were watching people around the world die. Governments not care about that. We were, you know, experiencing the BLM protests. Mm. It was a very like high, intense, stressful, mm. social, political landscape that we were kind of in. And I think the, the way to get for the general public to feel like they were kind of getting their power back was to look at influencers, celebrities, people of power that they perceived had more power than them or better lives than them, more privileged mm -hmm. than them. And I think the intention was to like 
opened their eyes to that. But of course, it ended up being a bit of like a, a pile on. It did mm-hmm. end up kind of getting a little bit too heated, I think, the kind of whole culture around cancel culture. But mm-hmm. that's kind of the the reason. It's people feeling like they're disempowered Mm -hmm. and using social media is literally the only way that they can get their power back. And it's Mm -hmm. true. If you think about our, like who in Gen Z, Gen Alpha, unless their parents help them, will be able to buy a house. Mm -hmm. You know, layoffs are rampant. The cost of living is crazy. Like there's all these things that, like I was saying before, sound so dramatic, but like the world does not feel hopeful anymore Mm -hmm. in the way that it used to, even when we were children. Mm -hmm. So it is, Uh, almost like a revolt. (laughs) Mm. And yes, sometimes it's not, I think sometimes the extent of how somebody is like canceled or the heat that they receive for what they did is not always justified. But I think the context around why cancel culture became such a thing Mm. is justified. And do you think you said cancel culture is dissipating now Mm. in terms of like the generations that are kind of coming through? Do you think it's because people have kind of started to lean into the idea that more than one opinion can exist in a space? I wouldn't say it's a generational thing. I would just say in the last couple of years, like things have calmed down because like life has gone back to normal a little bit. Um, And I think we did see... I think we can reflect on 2020 and be like, okay, that was like a little bit extreme with some of the things that were happening, some of the ways that we were going after different influencers or celebrities Mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, Yeah, I would say that it's not necessarily that people feel like more than one opinion can exist I think it's more that we understand that what you're seeing let's say on TikTok which is obviously a great example of this is 15 seconds a minute long Mm -hmm. it's not the full story it's not Mm -hmm. the full context and I think we are starting to slowly understand that and I think people are just like going back to the regular lives like people are less online right now yeah right interesting so kind of I suppose off the back of cancel culture is obviously that influencer culture. Now, mm. it's influencer culture is kind of what you and I grew up on, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. when we first entered the like Instagram, Pinterest mm-hmm. space, even, you know, as early as MySpace and we are talking about it just before with Tumblr. Yeah. Like this is kind of where influencers were created in a digital yeah. space, right? I, I read recently on one of your LinkedIn posts that Gen Z simply doesn't buy into an aspirational influencer culture with the same excitement that millennials did. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean for influencer marketing when it comes to businesses and brands? Mm. I think so. That's I, I don't want people to think that what I meant was Gen Z doesn't like to see aspirational influencers, because mm-hmm. I think if you think about TikTok trends like clean girl, that girl, those were aspirational yeah. and Gen Z loved that. I think it's more so millennials. We were the first generation, like you said, with kind of influencer culture. And we were a little bit duped because we didn't really know. Like we didn't (laughs) realize, I think, that social media could be so fake when it first kind of blew up. So now Gen Z is much more aware. They're less naive than we were, of course. It makes total sense. Hey guys, if you are listening on Spotify, do not forget to give us a five-star rating. It will help us to reach more people. So I think from a brand and marketing perspective, it really is all about uh, being, or I guess when you're working with influencers, Mm -hmm. finding influencers that are authentic. They don't need to not be aspirational. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of focus on like, oh, find a relatable influencer or Gen Z likes relatable content creators. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think they like also those aspirational creators, but I think it needs to be authentic. It can't Mm -hmm. feel like someone is faking their life. Um, And I think a good way to go about that is to find creators that are really niche. And I don't mean like micro influencers, although sometimes they can be both. I think sometimes people misunderstand when someone says niche and they think it means like a smaller creator, I think it's more so somebody who has um, a very dedicated following about one specific or around one specific type of content. Mm. And that's typically going to take more work to Mm. find creators who are making like niche or content that aren't just like, you know, lifestyle vloggers or whatever. Mm -hmm. But those people have very culty followings. Mm. Their following, uh, their followers are going to be very excited for them to do partnerships because they probably don't get as many partnerships. And it's going to feel much more authentic mm. to be partnering with somebody who is, yeah, creating content that not a lot of people are creating. Do you have any creators that kind of come top of mind for you <laughs> that are doing this really well? Oh, my God. That's a hard question. I guess, okay. I think, like, for me, I, I, I feel like there's a couple. There was one that were, I don't know if this was during COVID, mm. but there was a couple of creators that would go, like, 
it was the idea of dressing up to take the garbage out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and yeah. there was this whole like three or four like core influencers that mm-hmm. literally like their whole feed changed mm-hmm. to take the garbage bins out and they were wearing these glamorous outfits and things like that that we obviously couldn't wear during yeah, COVID. Yeah. And the other one that comes to mind is um, – I can't remember her name. There's two. There's one that she kind of makes everything from scratch. I don't know if you've oh, seen. Oh, Nara Smith? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Love. Yeah, She's yeah. very niche in that sense yeah, that, yeah. like, she makes everything from scratch. And mm. there's a lot of, like, I suppose parodies that have kind of been made off her. Yeah. Um. So she in herself has become a, a niche or, I suppose, um, you know, a corner of the internet that people yeah. are following. And then the other one is kind of the, the – um, Again, I don't know the name of the creator, but the the ones that did the, um, they had uh, like, it was presenting aesthetic fridges. Oh, I don't so know. So it was that like one. all your fridge layouts. Right, okay. If that gives you an, any kind of a spiel <laughs> of what looks on my for you yeah, page. Yeah, like, <laughs> very like, beautiful thing. Yeah, clearly. No, it was like very aesthetic fridge layouts. Okay. That were like how they package all their food in their fridge, how they lay it out with all their right. drinks and things like that. And there were two or three creators that were doing that really well that mm. I was like, I, I feel like became quite a big or a big niche in that space, but, you know, they made other people think about how their fridges were laid out yeah, and things yeah. like that. Yeah, I would say. An example that comes to mind for me is Mike's Mike, who is a YouTuber yeah. and he makes, you know, like deep dives into series and that's his whole thing. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not like a lifestyle vlogger. He sticks to basically dissecting TV shows and series yeah. and like it, his videos are amazing and they're long form and it's obviously different than TikTok. Mm. But I think finding creators like that who have a very specific content style who are, you know, speaking to a very specific audience, they're going to be so, that audience can be so excited when they get a partnership. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I love that. Um, Now, what brands are doing it well in this space when talking to Gen Z? Oh my God. Are there brands that you look at that you're like, they're really nailing how they're talking Mm. to this audience? Oh, that's a hard question because I feel like we so often focus on like the brands that are not. (laughs) Why don't we start with the brands that are not? (laughs) Well, okay. What brands are failing at talking to Gen Z? (laughs) You know what? I think actually, I think I'll give two examples. The first is that I think the Washington Post, when they first started on their Gen Z strategy, which was very TikTok focused, was doing a really good job because they were playing the long game. They had one creator. um, I think his name was... I actually forget his name. He was a guy. I don't remember. Um, and he not important. <laughs> yes. And he made content, you know, he would like basically make skits out mm-hmm. of news stories. And mm-hmm. I do think the kind of like skit vibe for media companies is over on TikTok, but mm-hmm. at the time it was very different. It was very cool. He, they were doing a great job doing that because they had one creator. So he was like a recognizable mm-hmm. face. I think that can be really important for TikTok in general. Um, and he obviously had quite an interesting and funny personality. He was making them in his like little apartment. So that felt mm-hmm. really like relatable. Cause it was like, yeah, same. Like we all live in these small little apartments, especially <laughs> in COVID. Everybody was like locked down and they were playing the long game in the sense that they were very open with their messaging that mm-hmm. like, you know, we're not trying to get you to buy a newspaper subscription now, but we are hoping that you have an affinity for us or you you recognize us now because of our TikTok presence and our strategy at reaching you now that in like 20, 30 years, if you yeah. do want to pick up a newspaper, which I can't even imagine in 30 years, newspaper still existing, but you know what I mean? If you want to consume this type of content, mm. you'll think of us or yeah. you'll remember us. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a really great way for like a leg- uh, an example of a legacy brand that's mm-hmm. playing the long game with yeah. Gen Z. Um, And then the other one is Duolingo, but they're just like top of mind because they're so crazy. Mm. (laughs) And I think they're a good example of what to do, but also what not to do. There's Mm. been quite a few instances where they've taken a lot of risks Mm. and it has not played out and they've tried almost like too hard. And then it kind of blows up in their face, which I think is kind of what we were saying happened with Bumble. Right. So Duolingo, again, meeting Gen Z where they're at, which is really important for brands. Mm. I think we need to stop expecting anyone, but especially younger people to like click a link in bio and like leave the platform that Mm. they're on to go buy your product or to explore Mm. your story or whatever you want them to do. You have to meet Gen Z where they're at. You can't expect them to leave the platform Mm. or to like, you know, sign up to your newsletter or whatever, Mm. unless they want to. So they met them like Duolingo. They're like a, uh, 
what are what do they do language like they're like so yeah. random yeah but they really played into like the humor side of things they met gen z where they're at they leaned into their humor they hired someone who was young to be in the costume and she led their strategy mm. for a lot of it um so i think just like listening to mm. gen z and knowing where that line is yeah and i think i mean i'll add two to that that i think that are doing it well and i'm interested to hear your mm. opinion on it the first one um is kip kick Keep It Cleaner yeah. with Steph Clare Smith and mm. Laura Henshaw. They hired Alice Harris, mm. who actually I interviewed in um, a previous episode, um, who is a Gen Z creator mm. and her whole job is just TikTok. Mm. And she has made them so relatable. Mm. She has kind of bought that authenticity and kind of, you know, Steph and Laura are very unattainable mm. in terms of that kind of, the, you know, they've had their modelling careers. Mm. They've started this huge global business but they brought Alice in who is this, you know, she doesn't have a modelling career. She's this normal girl that really resonates with a lot of um, other women, mm -hmm. you know, whether regardless of whether they're Gen Z or not and kind of creates this really authentic TikTok yeah, content yeah. that resonates with their audience. Mm -hmm. um, and the other would be Set Active and I think mm -hmm. they've been doing something that I think there's a lot of brands that will start to do that in the next kind of 12 to 24 months mm -hmm. is – Hiring, instead of kind of going down the influencer route, hiring creators to work for them mm -hmm. in-house. Mm -hmm. So they've bought a creator in-house to kind of head up their social media yeah. and they're the face off. Yeah. You know, they're doing all of this content behind the scenes where this guy has no idea what they're actually doing, you know, in meetings and things like that. And mm -hmm. they're saying, you know, he's kind of going and being like, what are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. And again, it makes their content really relatable and allows them to have a narrative that shares behind the scenes content from from their business. Yeah, totally. There's two uh, case studies that just came to mind. I don't know about the greater brand strategy because I don't follow them mm. close enough for that. But two recent examples, Revolve, they mm. did Revolve. They had a an after party for Stagecoach a few weeks oh. ago. And they part a million follower one. Yeah. Yeah. They partnered with Pizza Slime, which yeah. is like a streetwear brand that makes fun of influencer culture. And that's kind of their whole shtick. And that went off so well because it was it was a risk. Like, mm. you know, it was definitely a risk that Revolve took, but they knew that they blew it with Gen Z a few years ago when Revolve Fest happened. TikTokers, it was the first year that they were invited because it was the first year that Coachella came back after COVID. Mm. And when TikTokers went, you know, the culture on TikTok and vlogging is very different than even YouTube. Like mm. on YouTube and Instagram, people are trying to show you the highlights. Mm. TikTok is like, let's show you the reality. Mm. And they really did. And they were like, look at how Revolve is treating us. We're standing in lines for a million hours. Whether all of that was true or not, it gave, I think, young people who weren't super familiar with Revolve yet or weren't mm. like invested in Revolve, it gave them a bad taste in their mouth for mm. them. So... Two years later, Revolve has now partnered with Pizza Slime, which is so self-aware and so funny mm -hmm. because Revolve really created, in a lot of ways, influencer culture. They really helped mm -hmm. create that kind of aspirational, gate-kept culture around influencers. And so partnering with Pizza Slime and then throwing this party where they had, you know, when you first enter, there's a sign that says, over 1 million followers, you go this way. Under 1 million followers, you go that way. And people were like, what the fuck? Like, of course, from Revolve, this yeah. is so classic them. And then I think it was like a day or two later after everyone got all up in arms on TikTok about it, they made a response. And instead of explaining it, they basically kept the troll going and they kept the joke going. And they were like, oh, you want like you thought those signs were bad. Well, you should have seen our worst signs. And then they did a whole TikTok montage of all the funny signs that were inside the party to show us like this was intentional yeah. and we're self-aware. Like we yeah. know that we have not been uh, super inclusive when mm -hmm. it comes to the creators that we've worked with and all of that over the years. And like, we're open to that feedback and yeah. we were starting to change and that went over so well. Mm -hmm. And then the second example that uh, recently happened was Coachella. Um, did you see the poppy? Yes. Like Alex Earl. Alex Earl collab. Yes. Loved. So good because, you know, we Smart. have such a bad taste in our mouths mm -hmm. with brand uh, brand trips, right? Mm. Nobody wants to see influencers going on these brand trips. Mm. Every time there's a big brand trip with influencers, it is all over TikTok. Everybody being like, this is so tone deaf. This mm. is disgusting, whatever. So Poppy obviously still wanted to do something like that, some type of activation like that for Coachella, but they, I'm assuming, understood that the temperature on TikTok, which is really where, like you can say online, but really it's TikTok. Mm. 
does not appreciate that right now. So what they did was they invited Alex Earl on this brand trip and she could invite X amount of friends mm -hmm. and family. And that was such a good idea because first of all, we see all of her friends and family in her vlogs. So we are all already like familiar with her mm -hmm. kind of crew. So it was like watching her vlogs, but like on steroids, like mm -hmm. it was amazing. It was like her vlog sponsored by Poppy. It was so great. Um, it was like a little reality show of all these cast of characters that all know each other and that we all follow together. And it was just su such a good alignment, obviously, because like Alex Earl loves festivals, loves music, loves mm -hmm. partying, all of that. But it was like instead of them spending X amount of money on bringing, let's say, 10 influencers to Coachella to this big house, they probably spent that same amount of money to pay Alex and bring all of her friends and mm -hmm. family. And it just felt like, oh, my God, this is like a really sweet experience. And yeah. it went over really well. People loved watching it. Yeah. Which for me, like there's two really big themes, or I suppose, mm through lines in those two campaigns right mm -hmm. the first one is transparency mm -hmm. you know revolve really leaned into being transparent yes. about the fact that they're like hey we know where we stand we know we fucked up yeah how important is transparency for gen z's mm. yeah i think it's really important i think it yeah i don't know i guess it is it is really important i think it's not so much transparency it's more being able to laugh at yourself, not take yourself so seriously. Mm. Don't Gen try Z is too a very hard. yes, Gen Z is a very serious mm. generation. I mean, the world is very serious yeah. right now in general, not just for Gen Z. You know, it's a very serious place. So they are not looking at, you know, I don't know, corporate America or like capitalism as like life or death, mm. you know? So I think it's important to be self-aware and to realize like nothing is actually that important. Like yeah. we can all kind of laugh at ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose the other one that I, the through line that I see in that is um, kind of facilitation and kind of, as you said before, meeting Gen Z where they are. Mm. And I think Poppy did that really well yes. with Alex Earl, like so well. And I think that it's just such a nice kind of space to be where, again, you don't feel as though that brand is front and centre. You're letting the creator mm -hmm. be front and centre. Mm -hmm. And Poppy kind of took a back seat to it and just facilitated what she wanted to do. Totally. Because they would have done that anyway, to, anyways at Coachella, right? Like she would have gone to Coachella and got a big Airbnb with all of her mm. friends. So they basically said, we'll provide this for you and they'll be branding the background. But like, do your thing and do your vlogs like you would and just mm -hmm. have fun with your friends and family. And it was so good. I, I loved it. Now, I do want to get into some kind of ins and outs for Gen Z mm -hmm. because I think that there's, I mean, even in our office, there's mm -hmm. some kind of controversial opinions as to what is in and what is out for Gen <laughs> Z. So I want to be able to nip that in the bud. But before we do, I really just want to touch on, I mean, it's proper, probably a bit more of a, a selfish question, but you're creating, you've, you've created a podcast. Mm. You've got a podcast that goes out daily. Yeah. Terrifying. Like <laughs> I'm doing a weekly podcast and like there's so much involved in that, right? Yeah, yeah. What what comes into creating a daily podcast for you? Like what does your days look like? Okay, so my day is a little bit different. I don't have a set time when I release it. Like obviously it's going to be before, you know, 5 p.m. or mm -hmm. whatever, but I'm not very strict. And I think that was important. Not very strict on when I release the episodes. Mm -hmm. It's not like I have to get them up by like 12 or something. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on what I have going on in the morning. But in terms of like the podcast itself, it's like a 10 to 15 minute bite-sized podcast Monday to Thursday. And then Fridays, like I said, we have the bigger deep dive. Um, so I record the Friday deep dives the Friday before. So like after this, I'll go home and I'll, I won't go home. I'll go to the office and I'll <laughs> record the deep dive um, for next week. But yeah, Monday to Thursday, I basically will just spend, you know, maybe an hour looking for the right stories. I usually cover one to three stories, like internet culture news stories. And I'll write them out, like write my little notes on them, mm. my opinions on it. And then because our studio is in in our office space mm. it's really easy although it's shared with the office space so I have to kick my girls out and be like I gotta record now <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll record and yeah because it's a short podcast it usually only takes me like maybe 20 minutes to record and then mm. I edit them myself and then I get them up and I get them up on YouTube as well so I have to make the thumbnails and all of that yep. which is fun but it doesn't actually take me that long it's I don't know I would say probably like at total maybe two to three hours yeah yeah. It's not that bad. No, I love that. And one decision that I found really interesting with your kind of shorter episodes mm. is you've put the full episode up on TikTok. Yes. How, have, how like, what, what led you to that 
kind of approach or strategy because I think there's a lot of people that go, you know, snippets are like short form, mm-hmm. like what can people digest in like, you know, five to 15 seconds yeah. that then might hook them into listening to the full podcast. Yeah. Why did you decide to put the whole episode on TikTok? Well, we'd been putting snips, uh, snips, snippets on <laughs> TikTok for about a year mm. of the podcast and it really helped grow the podcast mm. before. Like my podcast is on season five, but for the first three seasons, we didn't film it. Yeah. So that was like a big mistake. Season four, we started filming it. It grew a lot because of like TikTok and YouTube and all of that. So doing the snippets was great and was definitely helpful. But when TikTok introduced the 10 minute feature Mm. and I knew that they were prioritizing, you know, longer form videos Mm. and I started getting fed more and more videos that were horizontal Mm. instead of vertical and that were longer. I was like, I wonder how this would go for longer snippets. Um, And then when I started kind of thinking about the daily podcast and how I wanted to do that, it kind of goes back to like meeting Gen Z where they're at, meeting Mm. my audience where they're at. Most of my audience is from TikTok, Mm. whether that's podcast or like our brand as a whole Centennial World brand is through TikTok. Mm. So I'm like, that's where they are. They want to watch this content. Mm. And I was like, whatever, let's just try it. I hadn't Mm. seen anyone else do like full episodes on, you know, TikTok before. So I made a whole playlist and I upload, yeah, the full episodes every day on TikTok. And it's doing so well. Like Mm. it's actually well over a million listens on TikTok since, and we only started it at the beginning of April. So it's been really, really good. And any learnings or lessons? I mean, you're so deep in your podcasting journey and you've Mm. been doing it for so long now. Anything that you would do again or wouldn't do again um, from a podcasting point of view? I mean, definitely film it right away. (laughs) That is like number one that I would do for sure. Invest in that. I think just investing I do most of it myself for the deep dives. I have an editor. I do the first edit. I just like can't let go. I think that would be my number one thing. I need to let go. But I do the first edit where I edit out like my ums and ahs and me having to restart because the deep dives are scripted. Mm. And that's actually like way harder than yeah. just chatting. You absolutely. Know? So, oh my gosh, absolutely. Even filming like <laughs> Nick, the producer here, he'll be the first to say like me sitting on this couch, no problem having a conversation. Recording call to action. Oh, totally. I'm like, why do I turn into like such an awkward person? I know. It's so much harder to record something (laughs) scripted and so much harder to prep that Mm. so I think yeah I would definitely invest in more help I Mm. think from the beginning but filming it is my number one regret like I wish we had been filming it from the start that is my biggest piece of advice for podcast growth in this current you know year yeah absolutely I love that Now, last question before we get on to the final three, Mm. which we ask everybody that joins us (laughs) on this podcast. Um, As I said before, you know, you are so deep in that um, Gen Z and internet culture that I wanted to run a few things past you and see what you thought, whether they were in or out. (laughs) Um, So I've got a few things listed here that I want to go through. The first thing is YouTube. Oh, my God. In. In. Absolutely. Okay. I love a deep dive, a long form moment. Yep. That is a misconception yeah. about not just Gen Z, but like young people in general, that they have no attention spans. They do. They have attention spans for things that they care about. Yeah. And long form content, it does really well. There's a reason why TikTok launched long form content. Yeah. Why you can now make 60 minute videos on TikTok because they know that they have the audience retention for that. Yeah. I think it's the same thing around like people aren't spending. I'm like, they are. Yeah. Like Taylor Swift proved that people exactly. were spending. They just spend it on the things that they Different think things. are purposeful or yeah. valuable to them. Okay. Interesting. YouTube in. Twitch. Okay. Streaming and gaming is in like live streaming definitely Mm -hmm. in twitch is like in but i think they have a lot of issues as a platform right now around moderation Mm -hmm. and kind of how they treat streamers Mm -hmm. so as a platform like they're not out but like they have some work to do they're on their way out if they don't change they need to fix some things they've lost some really big streamers in recent years because of how they treat them yeah right 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 emojis Definitely in, but like it depends on which emoji. Okay, which emojis are out? I mean, obviously the cry laugh face. Okay, obviously. I mean, <laughs> obviously. obviously. <laughs> Duh. Duh. Um, obviously any like smiley face. Is out. Yeah, okay. unless it's like in, a, in an ironic way. Okay, yeah. what, what emojis are in? Okay, like salute, absolutely in. Cowboy, absolutely okay. in. Crying, like actual crying. Tears. Ab- yeah, yep. absolutely in. Um, fairy. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in what capacity would I use the cowboy emoji? 
Like, I'm just sitting I'm there being like, dead. I actually don't think I have ever used the cowboy emoji. Okay, so I'm. it would be like if I was like, um, yeah, the podcast went really well today, but it went, but I, I'm trying to think of like the best way to do it. Okay, it would be like if, yeah, the podcast went really well today, but I was like 20 minutes late, cowboy emoji. It's like, I'm a clown. Like kind of like, it's okay. almost like a clowning around vibe. Okay, all right. Smiles are out. Definitely. Out. Okay, no did. Sorry for anyone that I sent a smile. <laughs> <laughs> you can send a smiley in an email if it's not an emoji. If it's like a dot, dot. Oh, we're going back, back to the old school, old school. way of doing mm-hmm. it. Okay. Interesting. And obviously hearts are always in. Always in. Is yeah. there a particular heart that is more in than others? I think people don't like the like sparkly heart, but I love the sparkly heart. So I think do whatever your heart desires. No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. Okay. Voice notes in or out? Definitely in. Okay. I love a voice note. I also think voice notes from a branding and marketing point of view are in. Like Ooh. I've seen some great brands. I mean, we do it with any potential clients that send us DMs. Mm that go, hey, I'm asking like this question about blah, 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 blah. Mm. And I just voice note them back because yeah. it's so much more personal than yep. just texting back. And they know that they're talking to a person, yep. not an automated kind of bot. Yeah, I like that. You know, that's actually interesting because I just engaged, like our company just engaged with a publicist and she interacts almost exclusively in voice notes over WhatsApp. And I was like, this is so different than anything I've ever mm. experienced. That's so interesting. I think it's so personal. I think, cause I think so many people, I mean, that's probably something that I should add to in and out, like automated messaging and bots. Is yeah. that in or out? No, no, no. Out. out of course. People want to talk to people again. For sure. Yeah. And I think for me, even from a, a service point of view, like you know, so many people when I jump on new business calls, mm. they're like, oh, you're like the like the person of the business. Like I'm not talking to somebody that, right. you know, is potentially just doing sales yeah. or just doing outward bound calls and things like that. Like, yeah, of course. Like who else would you be talking to? Yeah, yeah. But there are so many businesses that mm. put that kind of outbound lead generation yep. into the hands of somebody else. And yep. I just think that that's a really big disconnect for kind of consumers or people yeah, for sure. wanting to purchase. Okay, next one, which isn't so big in Australia, but I feel like, America is, mm-hmm. you know, in the States, tipping. In I or mean, out? I think I'm Canadian, so we tip in Canada. I mean, I think that every business should just be paying their servers or whoever a living wage. Like you shouldn't have it shouldn't be on us to tip, but you know, mm-hmm. I think that's pretty crazy. I mean, I will say that at least in Sydney, the price of things at restaurants and stuff is a little bit more mm-hmm. than it would be back home. And so I guess that's like what you could argue is like the difference mm-hmm. that consumers are not really paying that much more to have to tip. But no, I think in general, like you shouldn't be relying on somebody like somebody else's dollar. Like it should be your employer's responsibility to pay you the right amount. So then with that in mind, I've put my like hospitality hat on, right? Mm. You think about public holidays and things like that. Mm. There's normally a service charge on yeah. like public holidays or weekends to cover the gap of, yeah. you know, perhaps they have to pay a weekend wage or they have to pay a public holiday rate. Is that something that the employer should be covering and then bumping up their menu Mm. costs for? Like in my mind, as like a marketer, I would go, I would just make my menu more expensive that week and not have a service charge. Right. So that people don't see the the difference between the two. They just see it as like, oh, the products are more expensive on the weekend because we've then that trickles through to then being able to pay the staff more. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like you mean ongoing, it would be more expensive. Yeah. So instead of like, you know, I can go to a cafe, for example, and on a Sunday, they Sunday and public holidays, mm. they might have a service charge of 3% or 5% yeah. that covers that increase in wage that yeah. they have to cover as an employer. But as a marketer and kind of a, a, a brand, up, I put my hat on and I go, but why wouldn't you just add that 3 or 5% to the menu mm. overall? Yes. And... I then there's no meant. service charge yeah. because then there's people sitting there being like, well, why should I have to cover the weekend rate? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think if you're going to open, like if that's a government regulation that you get paid more on weekends or holidays, like if you're going to open a cafe or a restaurant, like that's just a cost of business. Like mm-hmm. you just have, I think you should just have to cop that. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> oh, controversial. Um, Snapchat in or out. Definitely in. Which is funny. And we spoke about this before we started recording. I feel like Snapchat was cool when we were younger. Mm-hmm. And like, I know there's a lot of millennials that were like, this was cool 10 years ago. Like yeah, we yeah. were the first, like you're not the first, especially with the whole low rise gene conversation yeah, yeah. and everything like that. You know, we worked for years to get to the high rise or I mid know. rise and now low rise has come back again. Um, 
Snapchat was really cool when yeah. we were at high school. Yeah. And for us now, like I wouldn't dream of yeah, yeah. having a Snapchat. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I think a lot of people of our generation think that Snapchat's dead, but it's mm. not. Like Jen says fucking obsessed with Snapchat. Why? I think because it's one of the only platforms that is still kind of in that social media like adjacent space, but that is really just about connecting with your friends mm. because that is a misconception about younger generations is that they are more, I suppose, public or less into privacy. Mm. Gen Z is a very private generation online okay. and much more private than us. Like millennials, we were all about like the personal brand. We were all about mm. the public Instagram profiles. We were like, you know, you need to use your social media to elevate yourself and to help yourself get a job and build your business or whatever and I think younger generations they have just seen how that's absolutely fucked us mm. <laughs> and they're just not buying into it yeah. like that's kind of what I believe has really happened and you know they're also much more aware of the dangers of mm. being public online like yeah. doxing swatting like so many things like that can just happen to you if you're you know, posting, I don't know, a TikTok about an opinion that you have, and then suddenly it blows up and suddenly you're doxxed. You know, yeah. they are just aware of things that like weren't even in the realm of our thoughts at the time because we were like the first generation to try all this. Yeah. And I think as well, you're so right. Like there's, there's obviously like Facebook messenger, mm -hmm. you've got Instagram DMs, mm -hmm. but now with Instagram rolling out a whole heap of features where like anyone that you tag gets it as a DM yeah. and I'm like, my DMs are just totally wild. Like I just can't even find messages that I had sent to friends beforehand. Yeah. So I feel like Snapchat is that kind of more personalized messenger that is in that closed group format as well which is why it's probably coming back. Yeah, and when you open Snapchat, you don't open it to a feed. You open it to your face, which yeah. is very unique. And it means that you don't end up just like mindlessly scrolling. It just is a much more positive experience. Yeah, community focused. Yeah. Yeah, okay, interesting. Working remotely, is it in or out for Gen Z? Oh, definitely in. Although I don't know my Gen Z stuff. I mean, maybe they're going to be like, that's not true. But like they <laughs> like love coming to the office. Same. Same. Really? Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I, I would love it too. Like I like being in the office. And also I think if I was young and starting my career, I would be like, I want to be in the office. Like it would just be so boring from home. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's different when maybe you have kids and stuff where it's like much easier for your lifestyle mm -hmm. to be working from home more. But I think... I think it's a bit of both. I think it's like good to have a hybrid. I would argue that millennials want to work from home more than Gen Z. Me too. Because I also think that millennials have grown up in an environment that perhaps has presented a more toxic work culture mm -hmm. or environment than exists now. Like yeah. in the office now, and you're probably exactly the same, like you've got to give people a reason to come into the office. Yeah. Like if it's toxic and it's not enjoyable and you don't do things that, you know, are enjoyable, like eating mm. lunch together and, mm. and going to do those things, like why would they come in? Totally. So I think that, yeah, I would argue that millennials actually prefer working from home more than Gen Z, in yeah. my opinion. And if you think about like the type of, like you said, with the work culture that we grew up in, like I had a job when I first moved here where I was literally chained to my desk from yeah. 8.30 to 5.30. Like you mm. were not allowed to leave a single minute before 5.30. You know, you had to get in at 8.15 so you could be seated at your desk at 8.30. Like that is a very common th experience that I think a lot of millennials had. Absolutely. And we as millennial bosses, I think a lot of us don't treat our Gen Z staff or our staff in general like that. And so it is a more positive experience for them. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I feel like the traditional office culture mm -hmm you've now got people that have been raised in that environment mm -hmm. starting their own businesses mm -hmm. because, I mean, I know every agency that I left, I was like, wait till I have my own business. Yes. Like it can't be that hard yeah. to treat people nicely, to, you know, treat people like human beings. Mm -hmm. And then when I started my business, I was like, wow, it's really not that yeah. hard. Like <laughs> what were these people doing? And I think it's just this, it's the lack of trust mm -hmm. that they kind of grew up in is this culture of like, you know, if I can't see you, you're not doing your job. Yeah. And I think that that comes down to trust and also giving your team enough responsibility mm -hmm. that if the work doesn't get done, mm -hmm. it falls on them. Yeah, yeah. You know, like every single one, you know, every single person in my team has a responsibility to deliver. Yeah. And if they don't, mm -hmm. It's no one else's fault, mm -hmm. but theirs. Yeah. So if they miss a deadline because they were working from home mm -hmm. or if they don't turn up to a client meeting 
because they were working from home. Like yeah. that's a really easily managed solution. Totally. But I think that, yeah, not a lot of um, traditional workforces think that way. Now I only add this one in because I did listen to your podcast episode about Tumblr. Mm. Is it in or out? Because I feel like it's coming back. Definitely. It's always been in for LGBTQ people. Okay. Like that has been a huge, like an empowering platform Why? for them. Uh, I think it started like early days of Tumblr when you could still have like nudity and all of that kind of stuff. It was a place where I think a lot of people, not just LGBTQIA mm. people, but also just different groups of people could kind of explore mm. their sexuality, could explore their self-expression because it was all anonymous mm. as well. So that was really powerful. And it was like a mood board. It was a little bit different than MySpace. MySpace, still, you could be anonymous, but it was all about connecting with friends. And mm. so that caused a lot of issues mm. where it was like, you know, anyone who for, with this anonymous user could friend anyone of any age and mm. that was just like bad vibes so <laughs> tumblr was much more i mean tumblr had its major issues for mm. sure but it was more positive with its like anonymity at least yeah. um so i think they've just kind of kept that through line like it's mm. just kind of remained this really positive platform interesting in that way it still has a lot of issues don't get me wrong but <laughs> yeah okay two more pinterest in or out oh definitely in it's one of Gen Z's favorite platforms. Why? Because it's also positive. Yeah. Like it's not about commenting. It's not about feedback. It's a mood board. It's all about like making your life better and more positive mm -hmm. and more beautiful and getting inspiration and creativity and excitement. And as a brand that's like, how the fuck do I even engage on Pinterest? Mm. Like, where would you suggest brands start when it comes to using Pinterest as a channel? Because it's really not considered like, I know with a lot of our clients that we speak yeah. to, it's like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube yeah. and TikTok. TikTok yeah. So Pinterest really isn't considered as that like even a social channel to engage with. Yeah. So where would brands start when it came to kind of engaging with Pinterest as I a mean, channel? The reach on Pinterest is actually wild. I think brands definitely need to get on Pinterest. We post, when we used to publish more on site, we would post obviously every story on site. Now we post like any clips that I make for the podcast that are not, you know, the full episodes, like any like promo clips, we put, put them all on Pinterest and people find our podcast on Pinterest. Like it's actually a great discoverability platform. Okay. Um, so anything that's like beautiful and aspirational, that is where you can post your aspirational stuff, yep. <laughs> you know, for brands specifically. Um, but yeah, and it's great because Pinterest is also a platform that doesn't ask you to, you know, go do so many steps to like link back to your site. Like you can link your platform, your site, your whatever, your Instagram, if you mm. want directly on the image. So it is great for driving traffic. And because you can do video on Pinterest as mm -hmm. well. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions mm -hmm. is that you can't, sh you can only share images on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, video is definitely really popular. You can do carousels now. Mm. So yeah, it's it's a very popular platform for Gen Z. I think it's definitely somewhere to experiment with. We actually don't publish it all on Instagram. That was like a, Wild. a big decision that we made. And we just said, you know what? That's not the type of news that we create. Mm. That is not where Gen Z wants to consume it. If they want to consume or just our audience in general, if they want to be consuming, you know, kind of commentary on internet culture trends mm. and creator drama and news and that kind of stuff, like want that on TikTok or they want that on podcast YouTube, mm. uh, but not on Instagram. So we just wiped our Instagram and said, we don't publish on Instagram at anymore. all. No. Interesting. Because I think that's where most people would go if they wanted to speak to Gen Z first. And yes, and like Gen Z's on Instagram, yeah. obviously. Um, but I think in terms of that's what where you have to know your audience and you yeah. have to know. And it took years of us experimenting and trying different things and realizing where they actually follow us, mm -hmm. you know, where we actually get traffic and attention. And we decided what's the point mm -hmm. if this is not where they want where they want to consume the news. There's obviously publishers that are doing great in reaching youth, uh, youth audiences on yeah. Instagram, but for the type of content that we create, no. And I think that's a really important point is around not only the audience, because I think people go, mm -hmm. well, if I want to talk to Gen Z, obviously I'll go on Instagram mm -hmm. and there's no doubt about it. But what you're saying is around the idea of actually interrogating what type of content yeah. people are consuming or Gen Z are consuming on where? those platforms exactly. and where they're doing it. Yeah. So it's like, it's not to say that Instagram's completely out, yeah. but the type of content that you're creating yeah. isn't for that platform. Okay. This last one is very contentious because in my office alone, mm -hmm. there is a divide in opinion. Okay. Is Slay in or out? 
Oh my God. Okay. Slay. I feel like this is such a nuanced question. So in terms of like culturally, I think it's coming, it's going out. It's definitely on its way out. I saw something where Gen Alpha was like, when uh, Gen Z says slay, it sounds to us the way that doggo from millennial sounds to Gen Z. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I feel like it will become something like that for them for sure. I think culturally it's kind of on its way out, but it's so part of like the vernacular now, like it's so hard to get rid of. Yep. Um, but I think it will always be in because of its origins. Like it really originated from 1970s ball culture yeah. and ball culture, ballroom culture, not <laughs> baseball culture. So I think for LGBTQ people, it will always be in. It'll always be part of their culture. And it will always be part of the vernacular. Totally. Absolutely. Okay. Quick fire questions. Before we wrap up every podcast, I like to ask three questions okay. to everybody. Um, the first one is name one brand that first comes top of mind just in general yep for you oh my god straight off the bat oh no okay I guess Z Feed okay so Z Feed is an independent publisher it's by my friend Crystal they do amazing work um they're not I mean I guess they are a consumer brand in the sense that you know her audience is consumers but it's not like selling a product mm -hmm. but yeah she's an independent media company as well and I just have to give a shout out to her like they do amazing work. Amazing. Um, what is one thing that you think helps keep a business or a brand top of mind? I think being intentional with your content. I think you do not need to be spamming people mm. like you used to be. Mm. You know, I think that was always like advice that social media managers gave or I don't know, platforms gave was mm. like, you need to post five times a day yeah. to be noticed. Absolutely not. You need, you can post once a week as long as it is fire content. Mm. I think quality over quantity is the new norm. Interesting. Last one is a quote that is always top of mind for you, whether it's something that you've referred to throughout like your mm. business founder journey mm -hmm. or, you know, a saying that you come back to quite often. Um, is there a quote that comes kind of top of mind for you? Oh, a specific quote. That's a hard one. I don't think it's necessarily a specific quote, but it's it's just like keep going. Yeah. Like that is literally what I'm just holding on yeah. to. It's such a hard journey being a founder. And you hear it so often from people who do end up being wildly successful is like you just have to keep going. And there might be a year where it's like everything is horrible and you have you feel like you have to quit. And then the next year is the year that you make it. Mm. So I think... For me, it's just like, keep going. I'm playing the long game. It's a slow burn. Mm. But if I just keep going, it will happen. So similar to the one that I say almost oh, really? weekly is like, if it was easy, everyone would yeah, do yeah. it, right? It's like the moment something becomes really difficult, I'm like, nope, but this is supposed to happen because if it was easy, everyone would exactly. do it. Exactly. Lauren, thank you so much for joining thank me today. You. I feel like I've learned so much and I feel like we could have kept talking for another hour. Yes, literally. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find you if they're interested in either Gen Z consulting mm. or your podcast yeah. or what you guys do? So you can find us on Centennial World. So that's just at Centennial World on TikTok um, and of course, centennialworld.com. And then our podcast is called Infinite Scroll. So you can find us there on TikTok and on YouTube and on all the podcast platforms. And you can find me at Lauren Meisner underscore on Instagram. Amazing. And we'll pop all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Haley. Before you go, help us grow and reach more people by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a review.